Uh, I know uh, a lot of senior scholars here don't need an introduction from Professor Go Gui. That's how you pronounce the name. Uh, he gave me a phonetics lesson uh, the night I picked him up. It's not Ngugi, which I had been saying before. Gogi, two different G's, a soft G and a hard G. First one is uh, harder. Uh, so, uh, uh, just so this, you know, I know the senior scholars here don't need an introduction, but we have a, a lot of uh, uh, undergraduate students, and I know students from my own class are here who have never encountered from Gogi. So, we have all these uh, books for you to look at that he has published. But just to give you the high esteem, a lot of senior scholars here hold Professor Goge in. Uh, I had a telephone conversation about uh, two days back uh, with a distinguished scholar in philosophy. And she said, can you try to get me a, a half an hour of conversation with Professor Goge? Because he's a legend. He's a mythical figure. <laughs> so that's what people say about it. Uh, but uh, just for the sake of the young students here, you know, I tried to summarize his uh, career spanning a half century. One of its earliest uh, novels came in 1962, more than 50, 50 years ago. Uh, and um, rather than rattling off the names of all the uh, books he has published, the honorary doctorates he has received, I thought, how can I do in five sentences so that uh, I don't take too much time. This is what we had uh, in the flyer for you, and uh, it kind of captures uh, what he means to a lot of us. But, I just wanted to give a, a brief introduction uh, to his uh, personal life uh, because uh, you know that's not going to come up in his talk. Uh, and what you will find uh, if you knew more about him uh, as a person is he's a wonderful example of a person who combines activism and scholarship, uh, politics and art, personal experience and the intellect. Uh, and uh, you know that's something that we'll be able to appreciate. So. Professor Goge went to uh, school when the British were still there in his country. Uh, and uh, he actually personally witnessed uh, students being flogged <laughs> for using the vernacular in the classroom. So he has written about it. Uh, we are uh, just the use of PQU, uh, or any of the local languages, uh, uh, was interpreted as uncivilized, taking you back in time uh, to, a dark, to the dark ages. So English was actually imposed on the students. If that was not enough, uh, over time, uh, just 10 years before uh, Kenya got independence in 1962, there was an armed resistance to the colonizers starting in 1952. And he has actually personally had to witness hundreds of people in one occasion mowed down by gunfire for resisting uh, colonization. So my country, Sri Lanka, is also calming, but you didn't see that kind of uh, Barbaric, you know, the violent uh, uh, re uh, uh, repression uh, from the colonizers, but he had to go through that. Uh, he did his education in Leeds, uh, went for his postgraduate work in English, came back just after independence of Britain in nine, from Britain in 1963, and then uh, he started uh, working against the new status quo there uh, about uh, the British had presumably left. But the values, the ideologies, the economic implications were still around. So one of the first things he did, he was working in the uh, University of Nairobi. Uh, he got together with two other scholars and wrote a, a document titled On Abolishing the English Department. <laughs> He's working in the English Department, right? And the point was um, literature should be about more than just English, especially in a country like Kenya where uh, there was a lot of oral uh, art forms, uh, vernacular literatures. Uh, so he actually succeeded over time in changing the name of the department from Department of English to Department of Literature. But things got worse. <laughs> uh, he published uh, Petals of Blood in 1977, and uh, there he critiqued uh, the inequalities in the new Kenya, in post-independence Kenya. And, uh, the, and also he talks about uh, still Western and foreign commercial economic interests in his country, and that didn't make his uh, the new uh, uh, the rulers of the country happy. Uh, soon after the publication, in 1977, December, he was put in prison, and uh, Amnesty International took up his cause as a prisoner of conscience and fought hard to have him released a year later. 
and they also said he can't work in the university anymore. Well, that was uh, not a good, uh, uh, not a good strategy, because he started being an artist, scholar in the community outside, which was more dangerous. He, I, I call it street theatre. He actually uh, performed, uh, got uh, ordinary people to perform uh, uh, drama theatre in the streets outside. So that was even more dangerous. And he found around 1982 that the government might actually assassinate him. And the other couple of attempts on his life, that's when uh, he had to leave the country. So he has been in uh, UK and USA from 1982 till now. Uh, I just want to conclude with the, uh, the, the influence he has on people far and wide, including a young student in Sri Lanka. The year is 1980. <laughs> it's remote Indian Ocean Island, small speck in the Indian Ocean that you can't even recognize on the map. So I was going to school there in 1980, uh, and it's another British colony, and uh, I'm an English major. And the syllabus there, we call it from Chaucer to Eliot. All the way from 11th century, so some people recognize that, yeah. 11th century to mid 20th century. And it's not just a sample text from each period, it's the complete works of Keats, complete works of Wordsworth, complete works of Chaucer. After I came out of Sri Lanka, I found that nobody does that, even in England or United States, at the undergraduate level, uh, uh, you know, particularly. So, uh, but I didn't have the courage, like Professor Ngugi, to, to uh, uh, resist our departments and ask for a different curriculum, it's not a very strange. But I got my opportunity uh, when they uh, uh, allowed us to choose a topic uh, for our thesis at the end of the four years. So I had, uh, uh, had information about the conversations uh, Professor Goge and uh, Chinu Achabe and others were having in Africa about the relevance of English for creative literature, uh, the relevance of English for a post-independence uh, colony. Uh, so uh, I wanted to do, write my uh, honors thesis on their work. Unfortunately, their publications were not available in my country. So I thought something new, something interesting that I can do. I found that one of my cousins was uh, studying to be a nurse in London. So I wrote to him, uh, can you find this publisher called Heinemann? Somewhere in the streets of London. <laughs> yeah, those are the guys who publish this work. And uh, try to get me the, the, the uh, works of uh, Professor Goge or Achebe that you can. Now, what would a nurse, a, a student of nursing know about um, post-colonial literature? So I didn't know anything would come out of it. But about a month later, I did have a package with the first four novels of Professor Goge. Uh, Weep Not Child, Grain of Wheat, River Between, and Petals of Blood, just three years after it was published. So I'm extremely current, far more current than my own professors in my university. Uh, that was the best thing to happen in my uh, educational career. Because uh, after I wrote my thesis on his work, I found that I can question the role of English uh, in the world uh, broadly. You know, um, I, I could think about, rethink the relationship of English with other languages. I could think about English as a Creole. They will talk about our languages as a Creole. But when I thought more about it, I found English is not one pure monolithic language. It has accommodated features from diverse languages all over the world. Just for your information, there are three words in Tamil from my language that Oxford English Dictionary says is now part of English. So uh, I could ask questions like that and that has remained with me now. So I'm here to introduce you to my intellectual hero, Professor Gogi Vatiyango. <laughs> I talk with my hands a lot, so I like them to be free, yeah. You know, first of all, I want to thank uh, Suresh for those wonderful uh, words. Uh, and, of course, for your invitation. You're following up, you're following up with my assistant uh, to and fro until you are able to find a date in which Kujak uh, would come here. Uh, I think we also had a wonderful lunch. It was lunch or dinner at a, at a Japanese restaurant you know, in yeah. Hawaii. And yeah. 
so and when you talk about the walk with being here and so on, and that really attracted me and it made it easier for me to uh, say yes, yeah. But I'm glad I did say yes, because I met very wonderful people as since I came, actually, you know, uh, including the one who tried to solve all the technical problems, uh, right? <laughs> Katie Masters, for instance, she was there trying to solve this, and then she went and grabbed a technician, I don't know from where, she brought him, you know, dragged him to our office, she did this and that, and in the end, I was able to, <laughs> to get my lecture uh, in play, at least printed papers. So I'm going to read from their talk. Uh, and then we, I hope there will be time for questions. I like question time because that's when I learn a lot myself, so yeah. Um, so when Nick Doyle, that's Nick over there, right? He's my witness, what I want to say now. <laughs> uh, from Applied Linguistics, and who is also assistant to Professor Suresh Kanagaraja, I tried the name in Kikuyu to, 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 to say it. Um, first came for me at Nittany Lion Inn. Uh, we stopped by a sculpture of a sundial which captures lightning. I don't know how he did, but he did very, very well. And rays of the sun surrounding the thunderbolt from the sun. We read the writing accompanying the sculpture. We could not, of course, could not find the name of the sculptor, although we did get the name of, I think of the Don, it was donated. But the inscription also was quite interesting because it informed us that such dials, sun dials, were made by Babylonians about 1500 BC. Right? So, a sculpture outside Nittany Lion Inn took us all the way back to the pre Christian era, if I to one of the early civilizations. And it could have gone on to talk about that on a, I don't know much more than that, and probably uh, he's still doing research on that. But anyway, from sculpture here written to Babylon, okay? Uh, and the same thing happened, again, when he came for me today. Uh, and as we were walking along, there's a different path. Last, yesterday, it was a path that led us to the bus uh, station, but then he got me to another, through another path, you know? And all the paths, of course, led to the same place. Amazing. Uh, and when today Nick came for me, he reminded me of the news item I had mentioned to him the first day about George uh, Washington Town University, whose representatives apologized to the descendants of the more, I don't know, 272 enslaved or 700. Uh, slaves they had sold to pay off the university debt. But I think what happened, in the meantime, he went and dug up more information. <laughs> so today, he told me that not only did they sell the slaves or the enslaved, but actually the labor of the enslaved is what worked the ground to ensure that the learning went on smoothly without material inconveniences. But more interesting is the founders of George Washington University. It is Society of Jesus. Okay? So what Nick and I were now talking about this morning as we came to this lecture was actually the relationship between slave labor, religion, and education. And if we had time, we could have expanded 
on this with citations from more universities and religious communities. We could even have gone further and connect this to the genesis of modern capitalism. Okay. But for purposes of my talk today, uh, I can only say that was a small exercise in globalistic reading of the sculpture and the newspaper item. And it's actually what people do in their everyday, naturally, until they go to school and they find knowledge is boxed into categories. That's why yesterday I almost fell off my seat in the room, 203 in Sparks building, this one, I presume. When I met Professor Emily Kroshkos, Professor of Philosophy, and in our talk she moved freely from mathematics to poetry, translation, science, African literature, uh, I mean, almost everything. She was connecting all that. Uh, like she was, she is all those things. And I could only think, what? Renaissance woman? Eh? The key thing though is that she saw connections in all those areas. And for me, real knowledge comes from seeing connections in a phenomena of nature, human society, and human thought. And that's why, since I published my book, Global Ethics, Theory and Politics of Knowing, I've been emphasizing the importance of global ethic imagination in the organization of languages, reading, literature, say, in the organization and transmission of knowledge, the idea of connection. Very simple. In our life, we actually do that every single day. We connect. But some process of education, like colonial education sometimes, makes us disconnect. Instead of seeing connection, and when you see connections, it makes us more powerful. We are more empowered by seeing connections, right? But we lose that power when we see things in pure categories, okay? Um, but tonight, I'll confine myself to language and the globalistic imagination. But at question time, we can expand on that. At the end of the 1984 lectures that I gave at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, under the title, The Politics of Language in African Literature, later published under the title, Decolonized in the Mind, a Maori woman offered me a gourd with some drawing on it. And she said, I want you to know, you don't even have to know my name, but I want you to know that you were not talking about Kenya, but us, the Maori people. And she did not elaborate. That year, that is, that years later, uh, after that scene with the Maori woman, I would have go an almost identical encounter at a Sami language college in northern Norway. Sami people inhabit parts of Sweden, Finland, Russia, and of course, Norway. Again, this time my talk was on decolonization. After my presentation, an elder from the community approached me. And she said, how do you know so much about us, the Sami people? Of course, I knew hardly anything about <laughs> their history, but he must have seen some connections. So what were the particulars in my lectures that made these two 
one Pacific and the other European see my experience in colonial Kenya as equally applying to the Maori and the Sami experience. Let's go back to my review. So recently, I came across a testimony by one Dover Samuels, a Maori politician, uh, and I think he was talking to the Waitangi Commission, but he was talking about his experience in school a long time ago. And this, when I found that part of the reason why the uh, Maori woman approached me in that way many years ago. He said that caught speaking Maori, and I put him, you would be hard out in front of the rest of the class and told to bend over. The teacher would have, he had this container which had a number of vines of supple jack out of the bush, not far from school, and he would bend over and he would stand back and give you what they call it then six of the best violence that is on many occasions not only did it leave bruises behind on my thighs but drew blood okay speaking in their own language violence that in this case actually drew blood. Now, the Sami people, European people, in Norway, went through a similar experience in the period between 1870 and 1970, what they call the years of brutal, or they call the brutal years, in an attempt to turn them into fluent. Norwegian speakers. Though that was now in the past, and today Norway supports some language, but the memory of it must have been awakened by my talk. Right? In my lectures in New Zealand in 1984, and in Norway in 2014, I had talked about how my education into English included being beaten if caught speaking the Koyo, my language, in any part of the school grounds. And the normal circumstances, you think there's no connection between violence and learning a language. People come to University of Penn, they, in three years they take up new languages and they learn them <laughs> without having to be beaten for speaking the other language, right? Uh, but unfortunately, a similar thread, violence against native languages, runs through the spread of English in Ireland, Scotland, and America among native peoples. In Wales, again I was in Wales a time ago, uh, some years ago, and they told me that those who spoke Welsh in the school compound were made to stand in front of the class with a placard on some say Welsh knot hanging from their neck. Same experience. Okay, that's I mean in the world. In most cases, acquiring a name from the culture of the oppressor was part of the language acquisition. As far back as 15, I think 98, Edmund Spencer, in his book, A View of Ireland at the Present Time, had talked of the forced loss of the Irish naming system as necessary in the conquest of Ireland. That's why Nick was very interested when he told me that your name actually is Irish. And I said, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> and what happened is 
The boy told me that, and I told you there's no O in Jerea because my mind went straight actually to Edward Spencer in 1598 in the book A View of Ireland at this present time. Yeah. I don't want to go into this, but it's very interesting that when the Irish, when their English settlement in Ireland uh, uh, resulted sometimes in, because the Irish was more powerful and more learning than English at the time, or, huh? but they were drawn to the Irish language, which should be the normal thing anyway. Uh, but this alarmed those in London. And from about 1866, or even after 1866, they actually passed laws, you know. Like one famous one called the, Tri uh, the Edict of Perkinet, in which actually there's people, both the English, and they are, are punished. <laughs> in the case of the English, they are threatened with the loss of their land, although it's still, you know. Is caught speaking Irish in that area, and also the Irish people working there. Okay, right. So, a view of Ireland at the present time takes the form of a lord from London visiting an English settler in Munster, Ireland, and he's saying, "Why is it?" With all these laws and other things, all these years, we've not managed to tame the Irish. You know, you know, what can we do to do this to erase their memory? And this English lord and the English settler, they come with a brilliant idea of guess what? Language and the naming system. In this category, if you do those two things, you help in erasing Irish memory. Uh, but of course, not only Ireland. When in 1910, Japan annexed Korea, she made Koreans take on Japanese names and language, as she also tried to do in Singapore in 1942-1945, after briefly wrestling, wrestling it from Britain, which was very interesting because like, there are two colonial languages who are fighting for the domination of uh, people of the area, because people of the area had also other languages, Malaya, Malaya and another language, okay? Uh, but anyway, they tried to do the same in Singapore. And now we, let's move to native. Yeah, yeah, let's say native uh, American peoples in this country. Mm -hmm. And we can never overestimate the impact of American colonialism on other colonies that came later. Because American colonies were earlier. So if Amer Africa, you don't mention the question, apart from the question of slave trade and so on, but the actual colonization of Africa takes place mid 19th century, okay? By that time, the colonial experience in America is many years, okay? So there are patterns of racial relationships and so on which happen here that are then actually copied. We can also model our, our colonial experiences actually, you know, in Africa. It's very interesting there. Uh, the connection, but uh, <coughs> so I want to give another example for the Native American experience, uh, and it's from a book called My People on the Sea, uh, and the author is Luda Standing Bear, uh, and this I was introduced to it by my colleague, you know, at um, Alice Cox, at Alba the other day, literally. Okay, so this new. This is new information for me, I don't know, okay? Uh, so in his book, My People, the Sioux, the other, Luther, Last Standing Bear, dramatizes this process in the education of Native Americans. The book tells of his experience 
as among the first Native American children to attend school, or the boarding schools, to speak, read, and write English at Carlisle Indian School. Oh, guess where? Down the road. Down the road. Oh, <laughs> we come to Pennsylvania. I come. I come. Okay. Come. We are learning a lot from Pennsylvania, aren't we? Huh? You see how globalistic. You see from this, we can connect. Okay, guys. So. <laughs> Okay, so we're talking about Carlisle. You know all about it, anyway. So, <laughs> in 1879, the very first research school for Native Americans, which became the model for others to follow. And I've got a feeling that the boarding schools in Kenya were a model on that whole experience, but that's another story. On entering a classroom a few days after their arrival, Luther and fellow students found a lot of marks on the blackboard. They were English names and each student had to pick one. The point the black pick a mark. Okay? Then the teacher would take a piece of white tape, write the name on it, then cut off a length of the tape and sew it on the back of the boy's shirt. Soon, they all had the names of white men sold on their bed as their first learning exercise. Lose your whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, this is also interesting, and I found this recently. That in 1992, Captain Richard Pratt, the founder of Kala, articulated the vision that had guided him in founding the school as, this is a word, but you can Google this actually, kill the Indian in him and save the man, right? That's what you want. Know. But see, the idea of killing the native to save them through their reincarnation as new colonial language speaking beings had been stated probably even more eloquently by Macaulay in his policy for education in colonial India. When, in the famous 1834 minute on Indian education, he advocated English as a medium of education to replace Sanskrit and Persian in order to create a class of people, Indian in blood and color, but otherwise English in mentality and everything else. In other words, a linguistically westernized middleman who automatically carry out the intent of the ruler or the masses or the ruled. Okay, now move to the French, right? Same thought. And this one I thought quoted in Walter Rodney's book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Uh, yeah, you, have, you, can, you can correct me, correct? Huh? So, uh, okay. <laughs> now, uh, Pierre von Sin was a founder of Alliance Francoise, or Francoise. And he said the same thing for the French. That when he saw that eventually these social movements in a <coughs> colony might end with the independence, he says uh, that it was necessary to attach the colonies to the metropole by a very solid psychological bond against the day their progressive emancipation ends with probably independence, that they be and they remain French in language, thought, and spirit. 
you know, they're not hiding their intent of these language programs, okay? You can pretend that way, but they didn't actually have the kind of pretenses we have about this. It's really reality. But even the 18th century struggles for the standardization of English had an imperial intent. According to a paper that, again, my son Okamawango introduced to me uh, some years ago, written by one Adam Beach, B-E-A-C-H. -E uh, according to Adam Beach, B-E-A-C-H, standardized English would become the building block of a metaphysical empire, an empire of language and literature that would outlive the actual physical empire. A metaphysical empire that would outlive the actual physicality of the empire. The problem is that, well, not a problem actually. Metaphysical empires, like other empires, create colonies. <coughs> So it's a metaphysical empire, it created a colony of the mind. <laughs> you know, mental colonial satellites that permanently orbit around the imperial sun. The colony of the mind prevents meaningful or nationally empowering innovations in education, in particular the language of education, in the literal sense of the verbal systems the symbolic, in a sense, of all the non verbal means used to educate and form policy. And you don't think that this has consequences, political, even political consequences. We have to get the example of 14, 14 African countries, 14, 50 years of the independence. They are national treasuries. Their money, national money, <laughs> is controlled by the Minister of Finance in Paris. <laughs> so when they go to borrow their own money, <laughs> he says, uh oh, not so much. Huh? Or you can't do it below this. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah? Yeah, he, he's going to be a witness. Because you can't Senegal, and Senegal is one of them whose treasuries. Is the Minister of Finance, not the Minister of Senegal, the Minister of Finance says what he can do with his own money. Right? Today, not yesterday. Okay? Uh, so, but that pattern is not confined to the French in one form or another. It is there in all the in the post colony. Let me just do this one. Uh, is there in the in a, in, a, in every col post colony? Mm -hmm. But the <coughs> but the pattern emerging in the context of the colonizer and colonized, victor and vanquished, may actually be part of the education system in any structures of inequality. Now the colonized is just an instance, really, of structures of inequality. Education may become a process of mystifying knowledge and its acquisition. Yeah. Say, mystifying the cognitive process, the process of knowing, the process of acquiring knowledge. Here, I have to make a distinction between education and knowledge. Knowledge is a question of a practice of continuously adding to what we already know. It is a system of from here to there 
there to here in a dialectical play of mutual impact and illumination. The normal cognitive process starts from the known to the unknown. But every new step makes the unknown known and therefore adds to what's already known. The new known enriches the already known and so on in a continuous journey of making connections. Knowledge of the world actually begins where one is. Knowledge that is. But education is a really a mode of conditioning a person to make them fit into and function in a given society. It may involve, and that's often involved, transference of knowledge, but it is conditioned knowledge, branded by the world outlook of the educator and all the education system. In the context of the extremes of wealth and power in any society, education as knowledge transfer can never be neutral. Here, we may have to borrow or draw from the dialectic of Lord and Boltzmann in Hegel's Phenomenology of the Spirit, which I use liberally in my structure, my uh, lecture on global ethics. In a small section, it is massive, you know, but uh, very interesting, it got very into the insights. You remember that in a dialectic, Hegel imagines a lord or master who never produces, <coughs> and a boardsman or slave who produces everything. And okay, and if I remember I cited George Washington University, huh? Society of Visa, okay, so it's not all that abstract. Huh? Uh, so you remember that the, the, the head of imagines a lord or master who never produces, and a bondsman or slave who produces everything. And there's a process of course, you know, just, you know. In the end, the lord becomes absolutely dependent on the bondsman for he can never do without the enslaved. What is the bondsman, the producer, could actually do without the law, right? Change to the law, he produces for the law to dispose. For him, without being chained to the law, the producer can continue producing, but this time for their own use. So we can imagine that the Lord is in charge of education and the language of its transmission. Do you think he's going to kind of mystify that relationship? The Lord will espouse an education and even the means of the uh, trans transmission of that knowledge that the rain forces the status quo. He'll do everything necessary to make the enslaved continue to believe that actually he's actually the one who is dependent on the Lord. You know, the Bishop says so in Manuel, so you will normalize that as the norm, you know, right? For indeed you the very foolish Lord, he's teaching the enslaved actually, you know you you know you can do without me or the other era. You know I depend on you, huh? right? And without you I cannot exist, huh? right? And this is how I'm connected to you. These are the chains. That, no, you say many things, including invoking. If you have a member, of, I'm sure those the society of Jesus at that time, George Washington. I'm sure when they prayed, they were not asking God to dismantle <laughs> their relationship with that. And they were saying, they were saying, God, think peace, you know, you know, bless 
You're saying bless the situation. You're invoking blessings on the situation. I was not there by them, so take my input. <laughs> I was in the But I can imagine you're invoking blessings on the status quo. But the status quo was different for the master uh, from that of the slave. So, but this is all very clear, clear, really, in the context of the colonial law and the colonial boardsman. And this was the basis of my book, Global Ethics, Theory and Politics of Knowing. The book, a product of the Welsh Welsh lectures I gave at the University of California, Irvine, was a further development of my ideas on the politics of memory in my Harvard lectures, which later published, I, were published under the title of something on and new. And those two were a logical development of what I first explored in the four lectures that I gave at Auckland University in 1984 that became colonized in the mind. And all of them do deal with the process and consequences of the colonial process, particularly in a field of education and knowledge. <coughs> the colonial process then was always a negation of the normal cognitive process. Europe, its names, its geography, its history, knowledge, was always seen as the end of the education journey of the colonial. In short, colonization in the area of education was always predicted, predicted on the negation of the colonized space as the starting point of knowledge. In the area of languages, it meant a negation of native languages as valid sources of knowledge, uh, intellectual and artistic inquiry. In the end, it created in the colonized elite the mentality of the outsider looking in, a mental attitude that persists in the post-colonial era. We see it in the way the post-colonial elite want to erase their names, sometimes their skin color, or the body sometimes, their languages even. They distrust their bodies, their geography, their culture and history as a valid starting point in their journey into the, into the world. And we see it in a continuous intellectual and emotional habit of the post-colonial elite and even government of looking to the Europe and the West for validation. They can do great things, you know, really fantastic things because they've got bright mind and so on. But that validation is always seems to be very important to them or to us, you might put myself there. We don't trust national initiatives, knowledge, inventions even, unless it has a measure of approving admiration from the West. We always hear of applause of pride and approval for knowledge obtained from imperial metropolis, but very muted applause for knowledge obtained in national institutions. Some of our institutions become copies of those abroad. And as you know, there's no originality in copying because even the best copy is still a copy, yeah. right? In all countries where the capitalist relations of being are the base of society, education and the acquisition of knowledge becomes a mystification of the relations between here and there. Lack of roots in one starting base creates a state of permanent uncertainty about one's abilities, achievements even. It even warps one's dreams and ambitions, like the desire to identify 
I mean, that which is farthest removed from self. The colonization we have been talking about in different places, in South Africa, Singapore, and other places, has to mean the negation of the negation of the colonial process. Knowledge starts where and wherever we are. Our, our languages are valid sources of knowledge. Uh, yeah, and I was, when I was in Singapore the other day, I, I was, it used to be very suspicious of uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the first Prime Minister of Singapore. I thought he was very angry of him, but I was very surprised about his view of languages, actually. I thought, wait a minute, I was very surprised because he actually had quite a broad language view. Uh, but one of his quotations really struck me for the beauty and the clarity of his expression. He talked to the young, he said, to the young and the not so young, I say, look at the horizon, follow your rainbow, go, write it. The implication is that you look at the horizon from wherever you are. I can add that we can all reach the stars, but we don't have to fast migrate to Europe physically or metaphorically in order to reach the stars. Look at the rainbow from wherever we are. We can go ride it from wherever we are, right? In the case of languages, the problem in any one country or in the world is not the existence of many languages and cultures, even religions, but their relationship in terms of hierarchy. The view that my culture, my religion is of a higher order of being than yours. In terms of religion, for instance, the statement that my God is more of a God than your God is actually very ungodly. <laughs> In terms of languages, this view leads some people to see their own languages as inherently more of languages than other languages. This is what I call elsewhere linguistic feudalism, the order. All languages, big and small, have a lot to contribute to our common humanity. If free from linguistic feudalism, I prefer the whole notion of network instead, yeah? because network is a system of give and take. Education policies should be devised on the basis that all languages are treasuries of beauty and possibility. They have something to give to each other. In their relation is that of the give and take of a network. Even if one of the languages should emerge as a language of communication across the many languages, it should not be so on the basis of, of its assumed inherent nationness or globality. Uh, but on the basis of need and necessity. And by the way, my question of global value, very quickly, I don't want to digress, but please. This, this question of global value is me mad. <laughs> really, literally, you know. Because the globality we are talking about, and sometimes, is actually the globality of finance capital. It's money. Money can cross any boundaries. You can go to China and back, and move, move, and no barriers to its movement, okay? So what happens? Free, smash all walls to the movement of money, of price capital. But do you know the opposite? Build walls to the movement of labor, right? So here walls being built everywhere. Even in Kenya, I'm talking about building a wall, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the wall, okay? Right. So we should be careful about this term. Because that globality can often mean 
that field of and democracy, the field of finance capital, uh, but not, but globalism as a movement of people and their social is actually now has to be hindered. Hence, this notion of nationalism coming back, not ours. But they don't mean ours in terms of finance capital being able to do. They mean ours when it comes to movement of labor, right? Stay where you are, labor, we shall find you when we need you. Huh? When you need cheap to produce cheap shoes or something, we shall come to you. Don't come to us, right? Like this is the whole notion. So we should be very careful about some of these terms, by the way. Uh, but even if there's one language, which is for a person community is across the many nationalities and communities, yeah? it is not grow on the graveyard of other languages. We should, in fact, have a new slogan network, not hierarchy. I personally don't believe in linguistic and cultural self isolation. I want to connect to the world. But whatever, from whatever I am. And the beauty of that is that it applies wherever. If you're in Africa, that's your starting point. If you're in Brazil, that's your starting point, right? You know, we don't pray in one starting point or another, depending on where you are, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so recently, I published another book, which is uh, it's called Last Night. It was actually published in India by uh, Seagull Publishers. But I guess last night I was reading, uh, it was so many publishers in Italian and French and other Spanish. Uh, I bought translation rights, so I quite a bit last night when I was thinking of this lecture. Recently I published another book, Secure the Base, Making Africa Visible in the Globe. I believe that the end of education is knowledge that empowers, that shows our real connections to the world from our base. And I cannot overemphasize it, that knowledge is empowerment. And if I know how to move from the I'm into here, I'm more empowered to be able to walk here by myself. The fact I came here to read me. Christian. Tomorrow he not need to leave me. Okay? Unless he wanted to have a, a further conversation with George Town. <laughs> right? I can come by myself. I'll be free, right? Because I know now the connection between a lion and in here. I'm empowered. But if he told me to jump at, at me here or I don't know anyway. It's a very it's simple empowerment. Should be the reason. Knowledge empowers. Knowledge empowers. You know, knowledge that's what empower is no longer knowledge, right? Because mystifying is biting you, it's biting me, okay? Mm -hmm. So I believe that the end of education is knowledge that empowers, that shows our real connections to the world, but from our base. By the way, Professor, I was very glad yesterday. When she was talking about, she was reading my novel, uh, The River Between, and I forgot the most of it. <laughs> 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 so, the, but then she was really trying to do here, we're trying to do connections between the readings, you know. So she went on a connection, and I was, oh. <laughs> I was nodding, anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, from our base, we explore the world. To the world, we bring back that which enriches and strengthens our base. We can summarize it this way. <clears throat> from here to there, and there to here. That's all we need to know. That, it seems to me, is a real challenge in the organization of languages, knowledge, literature, and its transmission in the world today. And this way of organizing the 
transmission of knowledge, the system I keep on calling from here to there, then there to here, the system of continuously seeking to find a real connection between the phenomena in nature, society, and human thought is truly an integral part of what I call globalactic imagination. Thank you. So, uh, do you would like to ask something from Prof. Jogi? Yeah, go ahead. So, you talked about this concept of fearless and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And this technology, the power of your voice, right? So, you insisted on the fear of your Okay, now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so thank you for the great talk. You mentioned this concept of here and there as key features of the global electrical imagination. Now, as someone who is familiar with Senghor's work, and which we can translate as, if you want to summarize Senghor's work, we would say it's basically the same kind of work. Like, he talks about Two, two major concepts. L'enracinement, which is rootedness, and ouverture, which is kind of openness. So we can associate here and there as rootedness and openness. So is it a shift that you have? In, because I know in your earlier work, like in decolonizing the mind, you were really criticizing Senghor with your, with, you know, his stance on French. Because for him, he would say French is like chocolate. When I speak it, melts under my tongue. French is sweet like chocolate. But speak it. you remember that? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So something like that. So is it a way of maybe coming back and joining Senghor? Because for him, that's those two combined wouldn't we would give something similar to global electrical imagination, but what he calls a cultural crossbreed. And then, similarly, Soyinka also was very harsh on Senghor, just like you were. But later, he came back and said, well, the point is, now we have to give credit to Senghor and the negative movement. But what I didn't want is that this aspect of being romanticized, I didn't want the negative people to do, and people have that concept of negative. So that's, that's kind of my question. If, and if not, what are the differences between your concept of global electrical and Senghor's cross-breeding? Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, first of all, let me say that's very wonderful of uh, Senghor. Uh, uh, I'm, sure, I'm glad he's catching up with me. <laughs> <laughs> But seriously, uh, connections is always from where one is. Senghor, if I knew right, first of all, let me just make this clear. I've always, I've been critical of aspects of negligence, of course, but I've always been very, very, from some of my earliest journalist writings, I've always seen uh, the importance of Negritude, including the work of Senghor, although he's make a distinction between this, the polity of Senghor and the polity of Césaire, <laughs> and later of uh, Franz Fanon. Okay. Now, having said that, Senghor, yeah, I don't, I don't Senghor, maybe, and you correct me here at that point, I, I don't know, he, first of all, correct me here, for what did he do for Wolof? And then Senghor, his school system in, in Senghor, and you can correct me that, I would be like, no. Yeah, Did he have a policy of empowerment of Wolof and uh, Senegalese languages, and then they go to French, or what, how, did, how was it like? Well, in the 60s, there was, there was a conference in Paris in which he was calling for like African languages as well. But it's some, not 
very known to the public because it was brought to us by Lilian Castellut, uh, who is at the farm or right now, one of the most critical of literary history of the negative movement. And also, Sengon is one of the first people who introduced African literature in France, but is also not known. Even in Wallop, in the case of Senegal, he came up with this, uh, the fact that we have, French is not a national language, it's an official language. So there is a difference between official and national. So it's the language we speak at school, whenever it's official, but next to it you have Wallop. Now, we can diverse, or we can talk about the hierarchy or the network, like which one is more valuable to the other. That's a question we can debate, but I think for the simple fact that he took that initiative and who was supporting and pushing, although he didn't do it to the end, for introducing introducing curriculum in Wolof and stuff like that. So that's my answer to okay, that question. Uh, yeah, I had about to, <laughs> you come from there. Senegal, so you always you know the more than I do. Uh, but the only reason it's still is Senegal ends up by becoming what? Before he died, he was actually the guardian. He's the only guardian spirits of what? War of? No. Yeah. Was he? I think he was a member, not a War of Academy, but he was a member of what? Sorry, I'm. Mean. French Academy, eh? right? Senegal. As not, I'm not criticizing, there's nothing wrong in it being, but this so ends up not by founding all of academies or academies or Senegalese languages. Yeah? He ends up by being the guardian of my language. And by the way, I think he knows the passage, we know the same passages we're talking about. Where he, when he talks about, you can see that in my book, The Color in the Mind. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, it's not even done for me by your friend, my dear. When he talks of French, oh my God, even if you don't know French, <laughs> you can actually feel eh? the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and when you talk about African language, you feel they are all blood, you know, blood and something else. But this other one is like something else, you know. Which is well, so we can debate about that. But the key thing is, if there are elements of commonality, eh, that's good. Eh? If we can actually go and see these elements in Senegal, also there, these are the strengths and these are the shortcomings. You know, uh, that's actually would be very, very, very important. I don't dispute with what is there. Okay. Finish our time. Over there. Yeah. I actually wrote it down. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It, it was very good. Um, <laughs> I have a question though. Uh, do you believe that the world should seek for a universal language in order to truly achieve connection and unison? No, if there's a universal language, I would have no problem. You see, this is nothing, there's nothing wrong. I mean. In my book, again, you call it in the mind, I talked about language in terms of communication, in terms of ideas or culture. So I'm trying to make that distinction. Yeah? And communication is part of our being, right? Communication, you know, is part of our being. Even our own, we can't survive even individually as human beings or as individual human beings without circulation of blood, without ourselves communicating with each other, right? So it's a communication system that goes on all the time. That's why if you, but don't hit me on the head here, even my legs, or oh, the other way around, you might, my, there's a wound in my toe, I feel the pain all over. Oh, huh? right? <laughs> there's communication going on. So communication in nature, communication in solar systems, you know, in everything, there's communication. Yeah? If you have a language that communicates, that's good. But I'm saying, it should not be rooted, it should be all on the, Imperial logic. Imperial logic all assumes hierarchy of being huh? and hierarchy of power in that being. 
right? Otherwise, well, I'm glad that, you know, you and me today, we are communicating in English, right? But there's no reason why, if we all knew Japanese, we could be doing the same thing in Japanese, correct? If we all knew Kiswahili, we could be doing the same thing in Kiswahili, right? So there's nothing communicatability or there's no there's no inherent communication ability <laughs> in English, yeah? right? Right? That's the only way I would say. It. But otherwise, I love it when I can sort of go to prison, I can speak to a person. And now that I'm learning a few other languages, you know, do YouTube, I'm learning Spanish through YouTube, you know, I sort of, yeah. When I hear Spanish speaking, I I can go near. I don't hear anything they say, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also Chinese and other things. No, to know to have a language is a good thing, but it should not be grow on the graveyard of other languages. For note that all the examples I gave from Native America to Africa, the question acquiring was based on the basis of negating Native language. It is. When it comes to that, there's no connection between negating one in order to know the knowledge of the other, right? Yeah, so that'd be great, but it should not be, it should be one of them. It enables us to do things, but it should be on the basis of its inherent uh, power and all negation of other languages, yeah. Maybe we can make one more question. Apparently, you've been in Pennsylvania a few days now. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. So, if you could gift us in Pennsylvania with one or two Kukui words, what would it be? What would be the word that you want to leave with us here? Ah, uh, Lyo. <laughs> Lyo means peace. Okay? Like in Sydney, someone say, Lyo. You know, say, Lyo. Lyo. Means peace. Yeah. It's a very nice word. Even the structure is very peaceful. <laughs> That's a good guess. Yeah. <laughs>